Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's Medicine Grand Rounds Conference. Uh, before we go ahead and get started, I just wanted to remind everybody, uh, you know, free to ask questions throughout the, uh, the Grand Rounds Conference. Uh, if you unmute your microphone, we'll be able to hear you if you're, if you're watching virtually uh, in terms of questions. Uh, and uh, you can also use Doc Halo if you'd like, if you have that uh, application. Uh, just please feel free to Doc Halo myself. Uh, my name is on the slide there, or Chris and Welch, my co-chief, and we can relay your questions as well to our speakers today. And, and speaking of mute, every, every time <laughs> we do these, at least one person is like <laughs> doing the dishes with their kids in the background, and so, you know, I'm sure that Peter and other speakers may, may have to remind people to mute, so just pay attention to that. Yeah, yeah. Please put your mics on, on mute. Uh, and if you if you wish to ask a question, just unmute yourself for that. Great. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'd just like to introduce our speakers today. Um, again, welcome to the conference. We've got a special presentation today discussing updates with COVID-19. Uh, for those of you who need to claim CME credit, we do have our CME code in the top right uh, of our screen, and that will be displayed a couple of times as well. So write that down or, or punch it in real quick if you need it. Um, so we have uh, several speakers joining us today who have been heavily involved with the response to COVID-19 at UH and, and within our community. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce everybody. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Robert Salata, who is our uh, chairman in the Department of Medicine, Dr. Elliot Sade uh, from the Division of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Sade is also the Medical Director of Infection Control at University Hospitals. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Furin will be joining us also from the Infe uh, Division of Infectious Diseases. Uh, Dr. Furin is currently serving as one of the attending physicians on our COVID Team C uh, and has been seeing a lot of uh, these patients here at the hospital. Uh, and lastly, Dr. Rana Hajal will be joining us as well from the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care. Dr. Hajal also serves as, as the Director of the Medical Intensive Care Unit here at our institution. Uh, to start, yep, so I Dr. Swat is part of the senior COVID team here at, in the UHHS. Dr. Yes. Dr. Furin, who started our TMC consult service, Dr. Sade, the Infection Control Director at UH, has been very involved in everything. And Dr. Zha is really leading, who just said, hey, you're awesome. leading the, uh, the critical care side of things. So, yeah, great. Thanks, Dr. Armitage. All right, to get started, we'll invite Dr. Furin up to speak. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for this opportunity to talk to you during um, these very strange times. Um, I think uh, the first thing I wanted to say, um, can I move my slide? Matt, thank yeah. you. So before I launch into my talk, I think the first thing I wanted to say was to really express a, a deep debt of gratitude to all of you. Uh, I've been really amazed with the way that uh, the UH teams have been responding uh, to the problem of COVID in a very stressful and difficult time. So just please know how much you all are appreciated. I'm going to use my 10 minutes today, and I'm a fast talker, so get ready for a wild ride, um, to really briefly review the viral life cycle of COVID-19, particularly as it relates to our therapeutic approaches, to briefly discuss data on clinical studies of new drugs and off-label medications that have been used for treating COVID-19 and that we're using here at UH, uh, to discuss the current approach to management of inpatients at UHCMC, and then also to briefly discuss measures we can take to provide not only scientifically competent care, but compassionate coronavirus care here at UH. Um, as all of you know, um, we have about 800,000 cases of COVID-19 worldwide, and we'll probably top the 1 million mark sometime this week. Um, so the COVID-19 virus is in a family of viruses known as the coronaviruses. They are single-stranded RNA positive viruses, and we've had experience with two of these in the past, the MERS-CoV and then the SARS-CoV uh, epidemics that happened um, several years ago and, and have not been nearly as bad as the, the current COVID outbreak. Um, but the viruses have a certain way they enter the cells. Um, uh, for our SARS-CoV-2, uh, the, or the disease, that, the virus that causes COVID, they generally tend to enter via the ACE receptors, the ACE2 receptor, um, and uh, they go through a process where they unfold, they integrate themselves into the host DNA, and then they uh, replicate virions, and then those are packaged uh, and excreted uh, from the cells. There is also um, a pathway that's not receptor mediated, um, but where the, the coronaviruses are absorbed into the cells. But most of the antiretrovirals uh, that we've been looking at target either the receptor um, binding or the uh, unpackaging of the viral proteins and the repackaging of the viral proteins. So. Um, there are several uh, drugs that are being used off-label and some that are being uh, investigated, and the investigational agent that seems to have the most promise right now is a drug called remdesivir. So remdesivir is basically a nucleoside analog, um, and it has shown activity in vitro and in animals against Ebola, other filoviruses, and then the coronavirus families. 
Um, it tends to work by inhibiting the RNA polymerase. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we do have uh, data on coronaviruses from animals and in vitro models, uh, including in vitro data on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, that we're all experiencing right now. So this is probably our most promising therapeutic agent, uh, and it's uh, undergoing clinical trials right now. It's administered intravenously. It's renally excreted. Uh, the adverse events that are commonly seen with it seem to include phlebitis, uh, headache, nausea, and vomiting, and then the ones that we don't see very often but that we worry about are uh, liver toxicity and renal toxicity. Uh, UH is currently enrolling in two clinical trials of remdesivir, and we're very proud and excited about this, and, uh, you know, strong shout-outs to our research team, Grace McComsey, Lila Hojat, and others uh, for the work that's being done, and the clinical trials protocols are, are up there, so... Um, then we're looking at the use of some off-label medications here. So these are drugs that have been approved for other indications that seem to have some activity against uh, COVID-19. One of the ones that you hear a lot about in the media, um, but that's gotten a lot of use is hydroxychloroquine. As many of you know, this is a drug that's often used uh, to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And the data that got everyone excited is a study that came out of France uh, where there was a single-arm study of 36 people who either got hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, or no treatment. Um, and the study, what they, they tried to look at uh, as a primary endpoint was rates of virological clearance on, on uh, serial uh, nasopharyngeal swabs for COVID. There are a lot of problems with this study. For example, six treated patients ended up, quote, unquote, lost to follow-up. Uh, but you count it as loss of follow-up if you got transferred to the MICU. Um, so it may be that some of the more uh, the patients that had worse outcomes ended up being excluded from the study. Um, but the French uh, made their database available to everyone globally, and some colleagues of mine at Harvard reanalyzed the data, trying to account for all the confounding factors. And they still did find a significantly uh, different time to viral clearance among people who got hydroxychloroquine plus azithro versus people who got hydroxychloroquine versus people who got no treatment. Clearly, there's a need for additional studies, and the big worry about giving hydroxychloroquine and azithro together is cardiotoxicity and QT prolongation. Another drug that's been being used off-label is lopinavir, ritonavir. Us older HIV folks remember this as a mainstay of HIV treatment, um, and uh, because of the activity against viral proteases, uh, this drug has been assessed uh, in humans for treatment of, of COVID-19. Um, the, the best study so far is a randomized control trial of 199 patients who had laboratory-confirmed COVID-19, uh, and this was done in China, and they were randomized to either lopinavir, ritonavir, or no treatment. Their outcome there of interest that was defined as a clinical improvement on a seven-point scale. And of note, half the participants who received lopinavir, ritonavir received it more than 12 days after symptom onset. And this is important because we think viral shedding and viral replication actually happens more in the early time period. So the study found no differences between the treatment and the no treatment groups in the primary outcome or in mortality, but there was a trend towards a fewer days in the ICU in the group that was treated. The adverse events of lopinavir, ritonavir are quite well known, um, and they're primarily GI, and there are also a significant list of drug-drug interactions with lopinavir, ritonavir. Um, many see this study as negative, but a lot of us are saying, well, there may be a role for lopinavir, ritonavir if we get it on earlier. Uh, as opposed to 12 days in, it's mostly your um, very ramped up immune response that's uh, wreaking havoc on things. Uh, and then the last study I wanted to talk about is off-label tocilizumab. Um, and uh, as we know, tocilizumab can kind of stop the cytokine storm, uh, particularly along the IL-6 pathway. And there was a, a, a report published out of 20 patients who received tocilizumab at two hospitals in Wuhan, China. Um, and they had multiple endpoints they were assessing uh, in this uh, clinical study, uh, looking at changes in clinical manifestations, CT findings, and lab abnormalities. They report that 100% of patients had clinical improvement, 75% required less oxygen, 90.5% had CT improvement, there was normalization in lymphocytes and CRPs, and they report no obvious adverse reactions. So uh, more will be revealed on that one. And then one other thing that people are talking about a lot lately is convalescent serum. I'm not going to talk about that today. The data is very thin on this, but I do just want to mention UH is working with Hopkins and the Mayo Clinic to come up with a protocol for convalescent serum. So just very quickly, our approach at uh, UH has been the ID uh, division uh, quickly established uh, Team C, uh, or Team for C for COVID, C for cool. Um, and so um, any patient who has uh, diagnosed COVID-19 in the hospital should be seen by Team C. 
Our pager number is 30422, and you can call us anytime you like. If we're in PPE, it's hard for us to answer our pager, so have a little patience with us. We've tried to look at a risk stratification approach to treatment that's based primarily on oxygen saturation. Um, and previously, we have been looking at extent of disease on chest imaging, although we're no longer doing that. Uh, we've been modeling our response on a really nice uh, piece of work that was led by Rana Hajal and folks in the uh, MICU called Mission Possible, and she'll probably talk a little bit about that. But this is just to try to systematize as much as possible our approach to these patients. So far, we've treated three patients with off-label lopinavir, ritonavir, five with off-label hydroxychloroquine, four with hydroxychloroquine plus azithro. We have not been using azithro in patients who have underlying cardiac risk factors uh, in combination with the hydroxychloroquine. Uh, we have two patients we didn't offer any treatment to, one patient who got remdesivir and one who got tocilizumab, and we hope to enroll two more patients in the remdesivir trials today. The last thing I want to mention, having worked firsthand with a lot of the patients and their families, is this uh, COVID leads to extreme, extreme psychosocial distress. Um, patients are isolated. They're terrified. Many of them are describing symptoms of PTSD. We haven't done the best job with pre-test and post-test counseling. Um, the families are extremely worried about loved ones. Care providers are worried and frightened, too, about their family's exposure. Um, we've had a hard time figuring out how to disclose to patients their status. And so we've formed, um, and there's huge amounts of stigma and discrimination. Like, I, I haven't seen anything like this in decades. Um, so we quickly developed what we call an IDR patient and community support unit. This is led by Marjorie Hatzegi, who's one of our nurse practitioners. She and her team have done a tremendous amount of work to try to address the psychosocial needs of patients, caregivers, and families. Um, and we have, from the beginning, involved the affected community in our planning in the ID division, so reaching out to people who are living with COVID-19 and their family members. We learned from the HIV epidemic that you have to have the affected community involved, as they often say, nothing about us without us. So that's been central to our approach. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to my colleagues, and I just want to say thank you to all you brave and amazing souls. There are lots of good words that begin with the letter C, uh, and we're using them about you all the time. So thank you very much, everybody. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Furin. Uh, any questions from our audience out there for, for Dr. Furin or for any of our speakers at the time? Wait till the end. Sure, we'll save questions for the end. Uh, if you think of any that you want to dock halo again uh, to myself or Kristen Welch, uh, that'd be great. All right, next uh, joining us is Dr. Sade. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I didn't prepare slides. I, uh, so we said questions to the end, but I guess we can take questions to me now. Do you have any questions already? Sure. So um, one thing that I, you know, I want to start with is just to make the distinction of what masks are and uh, what do they do. So isolation masks, uh, those are like the regular paper masks that you see every day, or we call them also surgical masks, procedure masks. Uh, those, uh, the main, uh, the main uh, role of these is to uh, for um, to avoid having some, um, let's say, droplets land on your on the provider's face, uh, and uh, especially over the mouth and the nose. Uh, and uh, also when the person who is wearing them is sick, also to avoid these droplets coming out. So these do not filtrate really the air. So if the virus is in the air, uh, these will not filtrate it. Um, the other mask, the N95 mask, mask we, they, these should filtrate the virus if it's in the air and uh, the papers will also filtrate those. So does, is the virus in the air? That's, you know, that's, that's a great question. So, so far, we, you know, we think this is a droplet or you know, we know this is a droplet, meaning that the virus is, is going to be, you know, in the droplets when you're talking, when you're coughing, when you're sneezing, all those. And then it will land on somebody else's um, mucosa, which is uh, uh, usually the studies will say 3 to 12 feet, but 6 feet is kind of the mostly cited uh, distance. Uh, so uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the goal of these paper or, or isolation masks, so very different than, um, than what we're calling filtra uh, filtration masks. Um, so uh, is the virus in the air? Yes and no. It is in the droplet. However, these droplets do not stay in the air for, for a long time. They, they, they will land 
almost immediately. However, when there's a nairosol producing uh, procedure um, that can be that can be uh, you know, for example, a cough even. So then the virus can aerosolize for for a while, and then you know it, that's that's where the filtration comes into place. But then in the air, you know that will the, there there will be air exchanges. If you are outside, the air exchange is definitely faster. So that will mean that the virus will not stay in the air. So that's why we're saying we don't usually need a N95 mask. If you are close to the patient, and there's expectation of this being aerosolized you're in the same room, you're doing some kind of procedure, then yes, that's why we are using the masks. Um, there's a question, is like, is, is, are we in a shorter situation? Um, we have masks enough for anybody, uh, for everybody. We have enough masks for everybody. Uh, we are, uh, we don't, we're not restricting masks per se. We are doing a stewardship of, for, uh, for masks and for other PPE. Uh, the goal is, uh, you know, I can, I can, I can mask, we can mask you all for the whole week. The question is, can we do that sustainably uh, as long as, uh, you know, the virus or as long as this is going on uh, while not being sure if we are going to get more masks, if we are going to get more of this? That's kind of the question. That's why we, why we are having these grids and these stewardship, because we want to make sure we're protecting everybody today and next week and the week after. So we can liberalize this as much as we want. However, we want to make sure we have enough for when this surges. Um, in terms of uh, return to work, so for the return to work for asymptomatic individual, so asymptomatic uh, people uh, who are exposed to patients, they, should, uh, they, they need to wear a mask, they can come to work, they can monitor their temperature. I guess at this time everybody is monitoring uh, their temperature and their and the hospital is monitoring our temperature in a mandatory way at every morning, so we are already there. Um, those, who have, those who are symptomatic, uh, what, we, what the CDC is recommending, uh, we, we, our recommendations are a little bit more stringent than the CDC at this point. Um, we are recommending for somebody who is uh, symptomatic and who tests positive, uh, we want them to be asymptomatic for 48 hours at least, in terms of fever, cough, shortness of breath, and without antipyretics, and then they will need two tests. The first test can happen at day 10. The second test will need to be at least 24 hours after that. And then we need two negative tests for them to return to work. So they, they are able to return to work on day 14. Uh, they will continue. So there's a lot of lingering cough. Uh, so they're supposed to wear a mask while they have this lingering cough, like just a droplet mask. Um, I, uh, do we have questions so far? We do have some Doc Halo questions. I think we can save those until the end of the discussion and, uh, and pose those to everybody. Okay. If a doctor or nurse is exposed to a patient, what do they do uh, and, 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 and what's the protocol? So if, if a doctor or a nurse are in... Uh, Dr. Armitage asked if a uh, doctor or nurse is, is exposed to a positive patient, what's kind of the protocol after that? Okay, so let's um, let's split that question uh, a little bit. So, um, if if you're supposing that the nurse and the doctor, you know, or whoever is exposed to the patient, are using uh, the PPE as as recommended? I, I, I think my question was: you, you find out you were exposed to a colleague who didn't test positive. Okay. You find out you're exposed to a patient who didn't test positive. I understand. Without yes. PPE. Okay. Yeah. That's that's the second situation. Okay. So for the first situation. So for the first situation, they are exposed with appropriate PPE. They are, you know, continue to have like the mandatory temperature monitoring by the hospital as well. You know, as we are all aware of, you know, we should all uh, be aware of our symptoms and our temperature. If they are exposed in a, let's say, non-protective way to a colleague or or or, or, or a patient maybe uh, without good protection, then uh, we we need to wear a mask, like an isolation mask, uh, for 14 days. If we develop symptoms and we stay at home, we call the hotline, we get tested. Any other questions? That should be it for now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yep, and you still work. You still work. Hmm. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Sade. Uh, Dr. Hajal will be uh, coming to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Hajal. So that was
was going to do it. Well, thanks for the invitation again. Um, uh, I don't have slides. I'm just going to uh, talk as usual. <laughs> From the bottom of the heart, I salute everybody, and I thank everybody for being patient and uh, um, team player, I would say. Uh, the team is getting bigger and bigger, and it's expected to be perhaps the entire hospital with several departments uh, on hand very shortly. Um, the, the symptoms that people get are predominantly related to respiratory symptoms in the beginning, and they are not related to upper respiratory illness. Sniffles, ear pain, sore throat, uh, not as common as cough. Cough is the most common, perhaps, with fever uh, and shortness of breath. Unfortunately, the, a lot of people with these symptoms can, can stay at home, but in the earlier phases of the illness, they were coming to the ER and they were uh, blocking the ERs, and hopefully the, the, the community in Cleveland will not do that as we surge, and they will only come to the emergency department when their symptoms are quite severe. We're expecting about, like if you, if you look at what happens to people, there 80% of them can be treated as an outpatient. And the treatment is really supportive care. All these medications that we're talking about are in the experimental phase. Whether they work or not, nobody really knows. Uh, so if we say 80% of the people are going to be home, the other 20%, when they come to the hospital, there is a big chunk of them that need ICU care, and that's about perhaps 14% of them. And But not all these 14% of them need mechanical ventilation, uh, which is extremely important. It seems like to me... Uh, everybody is so scared that we don't have mechanical ventilations, mechanical ventilators. I mean, the and the media unfortunately is scaring people that there are no ventilators, no ventilators. Uh, to, just to give you a little joke, I was on the phone today for this telemedicine thing, and uh, one of the patients who was COPD at home, 80 years old, he said, "Do, do I need a ventilator?" I said, "What do you mean?" <laughs> So he didn't really know what a ventilator is. You had to sit down and explain to him uh, what a ventilator is and say, oh, I don't need that. It's like, no, you don't. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the people who need ventilators are not going to be much. One of the biggest concerns, there are several myths that are going around that high flow oxygen doesn't work, non-invasive ventilation doesn't work. That's really not true. The problem is the, uh, the healthcare workers are getting scared of being exposed so they want everybody to be intubated earlier because you can close the system. And if you're breathing over a closed system, the risk for aerosolization becomes much lower. But in reality, when, when you have somebody who's on a high flow oxygen, who's awake and alert and talking to you and able to move about, they will automatically improve their ventilation perfusion matching that you don't really have to do much for them. In fact, the, the experience from China and uh, Italy says that those people, when you tell them to self-prone, they do better. And we're trying to take this attitude over here, uh, hopefully in the near future. When people come to the intensive care unit, the earlier phases of the illness is simply respiratory failure. It can be a pneumonia respiratory failure, but it can also go into ARDS. The problem with ARDS definition, we always think about it as uh, the, the criteria for it, which will include, you know, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, PA to FI2 ratio that's less than 300, et cetera, et cetera. These patients meet the definition of ARDS, but they have tremendous amount of inflammation in the chest. And in fact, the earlier series that came from Italy with lavage fluid from the bronchoalveolar lavage says it's a lymphocytic inflammation. So lymphopenia that's occurring in the bloodstream is because all these lymphocytes are in the lung and causing all this significant inflammation. What's reported is people get sick, they are in respiratory failure, they are probably in ARDS physiology, and you start treating them and supporting, the, uh, supporting them. When their respiratory status starts to improve, all of a sudden cardiovascular system becomes a problem and you end up with either VT, VFib, or uh, a, a complete cardiogenic shock that puts people back in, in the trenches. Luckily, when people are coming in, they are not coming in with multisystem organ failure. Sepsis is not necessarily a major rule. So when they come in, it's only one organ failure. And these are the people that we are supporting predominantly. 
the way we're approaching things at UH is by um, looking at the components of critical care that we need to support people with. We start with simple oxygen, doesn't work. We have significant, we have criteria to bring people to the ICU. If they are more, uh, if they are on more than four liters of oxygen with a saturation that's less than 93 percent, we're bringing them in. If they have pre-existing lung disease with with six liters or or higher, uh, we're bringing them into the ICU. At this point in time, when the surge occurs, these things are not going to apply. We have to kind of toughen it out on the floors and be a little bit more um, uh, understanding of what the needs are. When they come to the ICU, we will use high flow oxygen. We will start uh, self proning and hopefully we'll start with the uh, antiviral therapy first as long as they are early in the disease. When they are later, in the later phases of disease, there's a lot of inflammation that's occurring that I'm not even sure the virus has anything to do with it anymore. It's kind of the way the lung is reacting to the, uh, to, to the problem. So uh, strategy is, particularly on people on mechanical ventilation, is lung protective strategy. Uh, monitor P plateaus, monitor, uh, use low tidal volume strategy, early proning will, uh, are all these the natural things that we all do for ARDS in general. The additions are going to be whether we add tocilizumab or not. The antiviral has already been determined. Uh, we're, we're, like, uh, Grace McComsey has been trying to help us get into one of the trials that Roche, is, Roche has uh, regarding tocilizumab. I hope they agree to, to use us as a site. If not, we have created a, 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 a standardized protocol for the um, critically ill patients. Uh, which includes the type of patient, whether they're going to survive or not, based on predicting values using SOFA scores, and particularly SOFA sequentially uh, uh, looking at it on a daily basis, looking at it if it's increasing or decreasing. For the people who have high chance of survival, we will give it as long as we have it. And my understanding is we have several doses of it that we can, we can try. There are two other uh, possibilities that we're looking into. One of them is a nitric oxide study that's going to be, uh, we're going to look for an IOB soon for it. And then the second, the, and another one is GCSMF. Uh, G, I don't know, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, I have problem with letters. I don't know what this is. But anyway. Uh, uh, so these are in the, uh, trials in the making. But, we will, all, we will have a priority for what works most and what's the most logical. We cannot really just, uh, whoever come, comes up and thinks of something, we're going to add it, yeah, we can add it. At this point in time, it's really unknown. ECMO will be offered for the very few, the selected few. And there is, uh, in the Mission Possible uh, guidelines, we've outlined it based on availability of, of it, based on the survival of the patient, uh, three scores will always be uh, calculated before we say yes or no, and those will, will include the PSI score, although we, although I tell you it hasn't been working very well for these patients, but we may need to consider the uh, ATS, IDS, uh, SA uh, definition of severe pneumonia for it. We, so this is something we can negotiate later on. SOFA score as well as uh, the HLH score. SOFA score, actually, in the, in the Chinese data, it seems like if it is above six, mortality rates are very high. Uh, above six means that the organs that have been involved are, are, are quite significant. If you have a score of 12 or so, um, I mean, more than 90% of the people are going to die. We're using those definitions to uh, those scoring systems at the time of bringing people from the ER to us, as well as on transfers. So we are holding back on any transfer that is unlikely to survive this illness and unlikely that UH will be able to help. For those who have reasonable scores and uh, uh, adjunct therapy can be offered, mainly uh, inhaled, 
uh, ipoprostenol or uh, APRV, which is the kind of a mechanical ventilation strategy that can help a lot of people, uh, and or ECMO, we are bringing them in. But in principle, all community hospitals should be able to do proning. So if proning is the only thing, they stay there. But if the others are need to be added, we will bring uh, people in for that. Um, medications are in the ID hand. Uh, we, 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 we have two um, documents now. I took off the medications from the uh, Mission Possible just because medications are likely to change over time and every time there's something changing, we will rely on that. So that, that document will change more frequently than the Mission Possible uh, strategy. Fear is extremely problematic. In the ICU, people are, uh, don't touch, don't do, don't, you know, you, you, one cannot be paralyzed by fear. As long as you have a good gear, as long as you have uh, your masks on, all those things, what am I doing in that room? Uh, in that room, the uh, aerosol, aerosol generating procedures are the following. Uh, intubation, extubation, suctioning, uh, doing a procedure in somebody who's agitated. Uh, uh, definitely, if you if you're, want to do the nasopharyngeal swab, if you want to put an NG in somebody's up and, and coughing in your face, bronchoscopy, tracheostomy, Anything that has something to do with the nose or mouth has to be an aerosol generating procedure. Uh, if you expect yourself to be in a room on a patient with a ventilator who's not completely sedated and you're afraid that they are gonna, uh, the, the ventilator is gonna be disconnected as they cough and you're in the room, definitely uh, put to the N95. But if you're just simply uh, standing there, and you shouldn't be standing there, you should be outside, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, just put a, like a simple mask. Three things that we're doing that will decrease the need to go in the room. As you all know, the pumps are outside the rooms. The second is we're getting the ventilators outside the room. There is the, the ventilator can be mounted on the wall, like the ventilator where the bellows are will be inside the room, but the computer where you ch check things out and change it will be mounted outside the room in the near future. And we're working on dialysis to see if we need to uh, put it outside, although this is a little bit hard for me because of flow and the amount of blood that, uh, that's going to get out of the patient's blood. And the third is get, we're, when we need the glucose monitoring, it's going to have the transcutaneous one rather than uh, we just ordered those, so I don't know if they will be in time. Anyway, every day is going to be a different day, so um, just check with people. As far as who's going to cover, um, we are in constant talks with anesthesia. We have a kind of a big plan for who the intensivists who are in CMC. And we're going to kind of ask the Department of Medicine, whoever wants to volunteer as far as attendings go, um, uh, we'll just see whatever their, uh, their specialty is and whatever they want to do, basically. So, for, for example, we can always ask ID to look at all the glucoses and they'll look at them one by one and they will adjust their insulin. That would be a big, big help. Uh, uh, we can ask renal to look at the electrolytes and replacement and all. There, there are a few things that we can, we can do. Um, and obviously, you know, we're here to help. And eventually, you may have just uh, uh, an intensivist just looking at patients uh, from the outside and making decisions without even going into the rooms. Uh, the only thing that you will lose with that physical exam is uh, the skin, but I'm, I'm sure the nurses will give us a very good report about that and the abdominal exam, um, the abdominal uh, disease in this disease in this prob in this in COVID has not been reported to be a problem. That's all I want to say for now. You know. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Hajal. I'm sure. Uh, lastly, we'd like to invite Dr. Salata to uh, give us some words as well. Thank you. It is truly amazing, as represented by everybody here that is speaking, how collaborative this has been. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And this goes beyond uh, what we're seeing, you know, even in our own hospital and system. Uh, the cooperation uh, with the Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health, uh, just among others, is extraordinary. This is an unprecedented uh, 
time in our lives. I've never seen this of course, in my career, and I think it gives us all pause about what's happening. But there is light at the end of the tunnel, and I think we need to understand a couple things. Other uh, countries have uh, been able to control this. Uh, China, they're going back to work. They're going back to their business practices uh, this week. Uh, South Korea has been an exemplary country in that regard, as has Singapore. Germany has only seen a death rate of 0.5% because they instituted these very strict control measures initially. Uh, but contrast that with Italy, uh, of course, Iran, and I'm not sure we have all the correct data from Iran as well, for what it's worth, uh, and then the United States, which I think also has been hampered our efforts truly by the lack of testing material. We're just getting to the point where we're able here in a few minutes, I'll tell you, to do more testing and how we're doing it at the moment. Uh, and also we don't have great epidemiologic information about the spread of this disease in our communities. We think that community-based transmission is certainly occurring. Uh, how widespread it is, we just don't know at this point. I'll remind you of when West Nile virus happened in this county after it was first reported in New York City uh, the year before, and uh, Cuyahoga County and Cook County near uh, Chicago were the two hottest spots, if you will. But in addition to using uh, our usual diagnostic armamentarium, including PCR for that diagnosis, there was widespread uh, antibody testing in the community, which uh, really helped us to establish the level of uh, transmission. And sure enough, uh, with a high level of antibody formation, this moved on west. Uh, we still see some cases, but not as much. We are not yet available, uh, able, excuse me, to do widespread antibody testing. Everything you hear about uh, these quick, rapid uh, antibody tests from Walmart, Walgreens, et cetera, you know, is problematic because uh, it may still take seven to 14 days for those antibodies to occur, on the average about eight to 10, and therefore, you may be reassured by having a negative test when you really do have incubating virus infection. So let's stay with testing. Um, there are multiple ways that we can get tests done. <clears throat> One is through the Ohio Department of Health, but we're using them less and less because what we've done is stood up our own platform here for testing. And thanks to Christine Schmatzer from Pathology, who's just been amazing here in pushing this out, <clears throat> we now are able to do 400 tests per day. When we first started, we could do 32 tests per day. So that really has exponentially increased, and that's tremendous. It is still not where it should be. So at least for our own in-house testing, <clears throat> we are still triaging or prioritizing those tests such that we're focused on those that are the sickest, especially our inpatients and the ED, and, but our healthcare workers as well. We have to protect our workforce. And uh, unfortunately, over the weekend, we heard about our first resident that was positive, and we're waiting for a test for a second, uh, probably today. But it's happening <clears throat> as uh, this is uh, spreading. So we have our own test. We expect that with the new Abbott test, which was just announced as well, uh, which is a 15-minute turnaround time per test, uh, that we'll have even greater uh, access because we have those pieces of equipment here already. Uh, furthermore, we can use commercial test, uh, testing sites. Uh, there are four companies that do this now, but unfortunately the turnaround for these are on the order of <clears throat> five to seven to ten days. That's not quick enough for us to know, uh, especially if you have very anxious people waiting to hear their test results, uh, planning to have people come back to work in terms of our employees, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> we do this uh, in accordance with what I said. We also have a drive-through testing process. That's at Landerbrook, and that's worked very well. They're doing up to 250 to 300 tests per day, or collecting 300, uh, up to 300 uh, samples per day. There's a shortage of sa uh, sample uh, uh, testing swabs, and this has been another major issue. Uh, in New York, given how desperate they become, they're using the same swabs to collect 
cervical specimens for GC and chlamydia testing. It seems to work relatively well. We're looking at that. Unfortunately, most of the swabs that we're using these days come from what country? Italy. <laughs> and you know what they're going through, so that's a real problem. There are some reports, preliminary, where uh, a convenience sample, namely saliva, has been shown in Hong, Hong Kong uh, hospitals to be about, about as good as the nasal pharyngeal swab. <clears throat> and it's a lot easier to collect and is not likely to create the aerosols that we're currently faced with. So we're looking into that as well. He uh, spoke about um, PPE. That's critical uh, for our uh, healthcare workers. There's lots of discussion and planning about reuse. First of all, you can use N95s in extended uh, manners. If you're, for instance, going to round on uh, you know, five or six patients, you don't have to change in between. What you could do is cover it with an isolation mask, however, and that should be somewhat protective or a face shield. Uh, there is lots of discussion about how to re-sterilize uh, the N95s, and there is just a report today out of Duke uh, where they used uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide to do that. We have been in uh, frequent conversations with our colleagues at Steris and Mentor, and they actually were one of the first to create the vaporous, vaporized uh, hydrogen peroxide method. In fact, you may or may not know that this was the very thing they used, Steris did, to decontaminate all the federal buildings when they were, they were uh, affected by the anthrax uh, situation in the early 2000s. And they just got verbal agreement from the FDA, that is Steris, uh, for us to be one of their testing sites because it looks very promising. Mattel, which is an organization in and around Columbus, which even has BL4 capabilities, and they've studied things like Ebola, et cetera, just got FDA approval to uh, sterilize up to uh, 80,000 masks per day uh, of the N95s, but the problem is you have to ship them there, and we need something on site. The other thing Steris has been working with uh, 3M, the major manufacturers of N95s, is a moist heat process. Uh, and uh, the fortunate thing, if this works, is that we have these units for warming blankets, which can be dialed up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and that seems to be the temperature at which this will kill it. If you expose the masks with some moist uh, moisture from uh, normal saline that's uh, uh, placed on a gauze in, the, in a plastic bag uh, for a treatment period of only 15 minutes. So uh, we're getting there, and I think within a week or so, we'll have something more to offer. Uh, so that's really exciting. The other issue is we've talked about surge. Uh, Rana and others have mentioned this. There are a lot of models that have been actually put out for this uh, purpose, and uh, those include some from Penn, uh, as well as uh, University of Washington, obviously, where that's another epicenter. Uh, and the Cleveland Clinic put one out, as well as Ohio State and the state themselves, the uh, state of Ohio. Most suggest that right now we're finishing the first of uh, four weeks towards, towards the significant surge. And um, that's what we're basing our presumptions on. And we have our own UH surge model uh, as well that will be finalized today. And that incorporates many of the things that Rana spoke about in terms of number of cases, those in the ICU, ventilators uh, related to this, et cetera. We do not want to become a sole COVID-19 hospital here. We can't. And I think we have to use the resources in the community, and that's part of the plan. But they're thinking, uh, as is happening in New York City now with the Navy ship involved, with uh, construction of temporary hospitals, if you will, et cetera, the same thing will apply here. The university, Case Western, has uh, actually allowed, uh, if we need it, the use of the Veal Indoor Track Center, where you could set up a kind of a military uh, bed unit, as well as um, a dormitory that can be a place, or the Marriott, which could be a place for our healthcare workers if they really need uh, to 
shower and clean up and change their clothes and so on and so forth. So those kinds of plans are in place. There's been discussion regionally about using the Cleveland Convention Center, et cetera, if we get to that point. The other thing I just want to say is that many have been critical, not me, of our governor and Amy Acton uh, for putting these, uh, what some consider draconian measures into place, shelter at home, et cetera. But I disagree. And I think if you look at our numbers compared to even Michigan, we're, our slope, though it's increasing for sure, is not at the same trajectory as we've seen in other states. Uh, it, very close to us as well. So I think these measures really have been helpful. Uh, and we no longer call it social distancing, Rana. It's physical distancing because our psychiatrist has said we want people to be socially interactive but physically distant, okay? <laughs> it's a, it's a, a little bit of semantics, but that's how our C team comes in. Sorry. Lastly, just so we can be coordinated, we, have, uh, we are establishing a um, weekly conference uh, with ID physicians in the whole area. We have, uh, for 15 years, have had what is called the Infectious Disease Roundtable, which I started when I was still in ID, still am. <laughs> and uh, we're, this will be a virtual call, and we're going to talk about tough cases. We're going to talk about standardization and some of the trials and so on and so forth, and testing. <clears throat> And then lastly, because it's been an issue at times, the other, uh, I think, formative relationship has been with our ED colleagues. <clears throat> They've been terrific and very involved. And we have twice weekly calls with them uh, to really discuss tricky issues, uh, soft uh, admissions, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we're all learning. And that's the point of all of this. But it's been highly collegial in that regard. So. The UH, lastly, has set up a what is called an incident command center. And uh, this meets out at the CSC, which is out on Harvard Road uh, in Warrensville, uh, Northfield, actually. And um, it is people, some people are spending their entire times out there. I spent about half a day out there. But it's made up of folks from administration, finance, logistics, planning, clinical operations. Uh, et cetera, and it's a great way to interact and plan for the surge and a number of other things. The documents that come from infection control and ID, this gentleman has been very involved in that, and I want to publicly thank him for that. It's been tremendous. But I think the creation, Jen, of the Team C uh, really has uh, been uh, marvelous. It's a great idea, and we've got much more work ahead of us. So let me stop there and see if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Slada, and thank you to all of our speakers for joining us. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in through Doc Halo. I think the best way we can do this is get our speakers each a handheld microphone, and then Kristen and I can ask questions from the podium for everybody. distancing, but socially here. Okay, and Chris, great. So all of our speakers have a handheld microphone, and uh, we'll get started with some Doc Halo questions. We've had several come in. Great questions. Um, first question from Doc Halo uh, comes from one of our residents. So the primary literature uh, has shown that the virus is airborne for up to three hours in a recent uh, New England Journal uh, of Medicine article. Uh, is, is this the case? Is there any other data that have looked at this as well? That's, uh, that's true, uh, but uh, the Chinese have published similar data, uh, and these uh, droplets drop quickly, as Elise said. And they're probably, uh, through that process, the major means of transmission. Of course, we're paying attention to those aerosol-generating uh, procedures, and we need to be aware of that in this context. But yes, there is some concern about that. And so as a rule of thumb, in terms of our distancing, uh, we use six feet, because that generally is the vicinity around which uh, these aerosols and droplets occur. And it's really the ex extended time in that person's space 
five minutes or more. But that, in my view, can be cumulative. Uh, you know, if you're doing this over the course of two minutes here, and three minutes there, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's why we use that rule of thumb uh, based upon uh, the uh, theoretical issues related to droplets. And that's applied, Jen, to tuberculosis as well. That's been a practice that we put into place before. So I think it is true that there's some aerosolization, but the majority of this is through uh, the process of uh, droplet transmission. And I would just uh, tell you that there can be virus shed in the stool, that early on gastrointestinal manifestations, including diarrhea, can be very prominent in the heralding uh, symptom, sign of uh, this syndrome. Uh, and there has, has been a few cases of apparent oral fecal transmission as well, so we've got to pay attention to that. Uh, in most cases, that disappears early on, and it becomes predominantly respiratory, as you indicated, Ron. Thanks, Dr. Salata. Uh, another question from one of our residents, and I think Dr. Salata touched on this a bit, uh, but the question is, what steps are being taken to train the nurses and residents on extended use of N95 masks and uh, what do we think about the mask sterilization solution uh, that Dr. Or Governor DeWine, excuse me, has, has talked about? So in, in, in terms of training, we do have a document on the DWP on that, and we're going to have another one which is much smaller, uh, more focused, uh, probably by tomorrow morning. And uh, also the nurse educators are working actively on educating the nurses on that. and. Uh, if, if uh, I mean, we can also extend that to uh, to, uh, to all. Uh, they they are also involved with educating other providers, such as physicians. And in terms of uh, cleaning up, so what, as Dr. Salta uh, mentioned, uh, we we are actively working on our internal process for that, and we are actually we are also uh, uh, having contracts with outside companies uh, like Mattel, for example, Steris, and others for that too. Actually, may I add, uh, anesthesia has been working on the baking technique for, for a while, and the, this week they're going to try to test it uh, in the ORs, uh, just to see what's happening with the mask. And if it works very well, we'll probably adopt it. And uh, Am Amrita and uh, Shine are working on something different, but I'm not sure how good is it. We've been trying so, Amrita, maybe not all the house staff remember you, but can you tell us who you are, please? Uh, I'm Amrita John. I'm uh, working in the MICU as uh, an ID fellowship and critical care fellowship training. Uh, so what we're looking at is basically parasitic acid fumigation to be able to reuse our N95s and um, face masks and gowns. Uh, we're also looking at the dry heat sterilization and looking if any of the um, biological markers like um, uh, bacteriophages can be eliminated using that method. Thank you for that work and for Shine as well. That's tremendous. This is another great indicator of how everybody's getting involved in any way they can. All right, thank you. Uh, another question from one of the residents regarding uh, providers who test positive uh, for COVID-19. Just to kind of clarify the come back to work policy, um, basically they've been told that they would not be allowed to work uh, for 14 days after the first symptoms and then two negative tests after that. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yep. So um, the CDC has two sets of recommendations. One is testing focused. The other is syndromic, as long as your syndrome improves. Uh, we are taking uh, at this point, and this is an, a point of evolution, right? Uh, we're taking a much more conservative approach and usually around 10 days because the PCR test, at least from respiratory uh, secretions, can last uh, uh, from nasopharyngeal uh, swabs can last up to set more than seven days, seven, eight days. So around 10 days, we may do the first test as long as they have resolution of their fever and improvement of their respiratory syndrome. And then 24 hours later, if that test is negative, that puts them around the 14-day mark anyhow. That's what we're using currently. Uh, but there are recent reports out of China again, though the nasopharyngeal swab becomes negative, their their uh, virus is still found, or by PCR it's still positive in sputum and in stool. And the question is whether those are intact virions 
a live virus or not, because it just is detecting genetic material. We don't know that yet, but that's the rule that we're using right now. And we, fortunately, we've only had one of our uh, residents that was positive. All told in the entire system, uh, as of late yesterday, we had 28 um, healthcare workers that were infected. And there was a mini outbreak in the neonatal intensive care unit as well, but fortunately none of the babies were positive. We have one resident positive in the department. We do have in other departments also. Yes. And in terms of, uh, I mean, the key for symptoms is improvements because, you know, some may have a lingering cough. Again, that's why we want them to wear a mask when they come back. When they come back. Uh, kind of a similar related question, I guess, for some of our providers when, when providing uh, guidance to our patients. Uh, for a likely COVID-19 patient that hasn't been tested but that's self-isolating at home, um, how long should they be isolated at home before they can go back to work? So the, the CDC does address that, uh, but I, I would say that's not what we are recommending for, uh, for healthcare workers. Uh, they have like the non-testing strategy is uh, they can come back to work at seven days if their symptoms have improved, uh, seven days after their symptoms started. And it should be two days after the fever is, uh, resolves and uh, at least also two days after the symptoms have improved. But we're not doing that for healthcare workers. We want to be uh, super extra safe, uh, especially to avoid transmission. And at this point in time, if you don't know these statistics, among those that are infected in Ohio, 17% at this point are healthcare workers. So we have to protect them. Uh, we would like, as has been done in other facilities, to provide each employee a mask, a surgical mask, when they come uh, to be checked in every morning. But if we are going to do that, we need 200,000 masks per week throughout the system. We don't have that much right now. So what we try to do is make them more available in the cohorted areas at the moment. Uh, the uh, new, new MICU, which may be the new MICU forever, we'll, we'll see, uh, <laughs> Lakeside 60, uh, and the ED. So what we're trying to do is get more in and uh, to the point where we can provide everyone with masks. Uh, there's been lots of chatter about these do-it-yourself masks that people are sewing, and uh, they're probably, uh, and Ellie already addressed this a little bit, but they're not as effective, certainly, as a surgical mask. So the numbers are, <clears throat> with these uh, homemade masks, maybe 40% effective, whereas with the uh, surgical mask, it's about 76% effective, and N95s are well over 98% effective. And even better... Uh, many of our residents are being uh, are fitted for PAPRs at the uh, VA. We have available at, at CMC right now seven PAPRs. Seven. Come on. Right. <laughs> but they're ordering more, but we may not get some for seven uh, weeks or so. So please share your PAPRs. Yeah. <laughs> get under the same hood. Okay, great. We've received a lot of questions on So uh, can I yeah. ask uh, Jen? to comment on, there's been controversy about using ibuprofen versus other antipyretics and also the issue of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Yeah, so there, there are some theoretical concerns. Obviously, these are anti-inflammatories or medications that block sort of the, the renin angiotensin in system. And with the ACE inhibitors in particular, it's thought if you're taking an ACE inhibitor that there might be upregulation of the receptors that COVID-19 binds to. Um, so the official word is don't stop ACE inhibitors in your patients um, because the risks of doing so probably far outweigh uh, the risk of upregulation and increased um, uh, chances of becoming sick with COVID. Different groups have put out different recommendations around ibuprofen usage. Um, I think what we're telling people is if you don't have to take it, probably best to use Tylenol or acetaminophen as an antipyretic. So. Uh, receiving a lot of questions via Doc Halo, probably more than we'll be able to uh, address today, but uh, we'll do our best. Um, we did have a question uh, from an attending. Uh, are we able to share some numbers regarding COVID positive admissions at UACMC? Uh, how many have we had any deaths so far as well? 
Yeah, so this is Jennifer, and so I know Keith and, and um, probably the chief residents can answer better some about the, the people under investigation. I do believe we've had somewhere in the range of 80 to 90 people yeah. who've been under investigation. Oh, so yep. Yeah, right now our COVID service is following 14 positive patients, and we've discharged uh, four to home. Um, so far we have not had any deaths, but we do have a couple of patients who are on comfort measures, and we anticipate we will see some deaths sometime soon. There was a death as well in the ED of a nursing home patient, and that's another thing that's starting to spike up around the area. And just everybody remember what happened in Kings County in that nursing home uh, in and around Seattle. It could be devastating in that patient population. So we're working with the public health folks in that respect as well. For our in-house testing, currently what's the turnaround time for those done? So general, they're uh, doing this real time, but most tests are available within 24 hours, if not 12. Okay. Uh, that's where we're at. And that's much better, as I said, than the commercial labs right now. And then also if we got the 15-minute test, how many of those could we potentially do per day? Uh, we don't know yet because Abbott has not released the testing materials to us. But uh, I've been told by uh, Christine Schmatzer again that maybe an additional uh, two to, uh, 200 to 500 tests per day. And this is Jennifer. Just to chime in on that, I love the lab people, and our lab people have been amazing in this. So if you see them, thank them. Often when they quote you 15 minutes, they mean from the time they get the sample into their machine until the time their machine prints out the result. It is not ever 15 minutes from the time the patient is seen until you have the results in your hand as provider. So just be aware of that. Uh, a couple more questions here. Um, you know, we touched about uh, touched on masks a bit, but another uh, question relating surgical masks. Uh, would you recommend using surgical masks on the regular nursing floors where patients might be asymptomatic but potentially shedding virus if they're positive? So our position, which has been taken in other countries, China, for instance, Germany, and um, in Boston, in New York, et cetera, is that that's what we'd like to do. It's a supply and demand issue, however. And given where we're currently at, we've tried to focus the use of those and supply of those to those areas. Unfortunately, many of these masks have disappeared. People are taking them and hoarding them, et cetera, et cetera including N95, so it may seem harsh, but uh, there are now security folks in and around <laughs> yeah. guarding this. Please. So we, uh, there's, uh, like, the security for, uh, like, we'll ask you about your mask. But, I um, mean, going back to uh, to the question, I mean, so uh, if we, uh, so the grid or PPE preference is, is set so that you, when you are in high-risk situation and high-probability situation, you are well-protected, if we tell people today wear masks all the time, that means that they, we're going to, how, how much more are you going to protect people? That's, that's a very, 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 very extremely low percentage of additional protection uh, at the risk of running out next week when we really need them for the high risk situation. So that's kind of the balance that we are making here. But we are getting more masks. They've been we, ordered. We are, um, we are, and as we have that available, we'll certainly make those available. We are getting more masks. Um, as, as, as Bob said, we do have that situation of uh, uh, take one for now and take one for later, uh, which, you know, is also uh, burning through our stock. Uh, so uh, that's my five cents on that. Good. Kristen? Well, one more, sorry. Uh, what's the current sensitivity of our in-house testing? And then since today we have the rapid test, if we got that? That's a good question. So it really depends in the end, Kristen, when you hear what I'm going to tell you, uh, on the adequacy and the quality of the specimen obtained. So we're doubling down with those that are obtaining these specimens in terms of the proper technique, et cetera. Um, and we're looking, as I said before, at convenience samples like saliva that might be uh, relatively sensitive as well. But uh, across the country, the sensitivity is on the order of 80 to 92 percent. And this begs the question, therefore, as to whether or not you get an initial negative test in someone, whether you should pursue a second. If they're still symptomatic and you have a high concern and they've been exposed, we are allowing second test to be done. 
but generally speaking, it, they're quite specific too. So that's the other thing you need to hear. But the sensitivity does have, uh, it's not 100%. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go ahead and, uh, and, and finish up here. I'd like to thank the nearly 300 people that actually joined us for this uh, Grand Rounds virtually. So thank you for, for uh, coming out and listening to us. Uh, we weren't able to get to all the questions today. If, if anybody sent a question that wasn't answered, please feel free to email myself, uh, Peter Sarek at uh, peter.sarek at uhhospitals.org, or Kristen Welch, my co-chief, and we can try to get those questions answered for you if you have any questions, okay? Thank you guys so much for joining us, and thank you to our speakers.